Isn't that pleasant, those crickets? Isn't that what we all wished was list we were listening to? When in fact, in the scheme of things, those crickets are really not a good thing when it means your silence against an oppression. And that's the thing we're up against as much as I hate to say that all the time. Uh, we can complain about it, but if we don't act against it in some way, it continues. And it's going to continue. And it, the, the organization is there for it to continue. And until we start to understand the organization, we're not going to have a whole lot that we're going to be able to fight correctly. It will continue to win. As I keep bringing up, when we apply these things and try to educate people about them, we get we are we are thought on the point of how you've addressed the enemy against us that we are infiltrated and surrounded about. And there's only until you get that you won't understand how it how it how this trick is being done against us. And so the and again the only thing I can I would rather be doing something else, but but, but because this thing is in the way, no matter where I go, no matter where I see it, no matter the people that I work with go, it wasn't just some off chance thing and getting involved with the government you don't want to get involved. No, this is the government. This oppression is the government. It's not that governments are oppressive. I'm talking about a veneer of a governance, not the government. So, what I'm talking, I don't even, I get stuttery here, folks. It, it, the more I think about what I'm doing here, I don't even understand how people can argue with what I'm saying or argue with whatever I'm doing or argue with how I'm coming at it when nobody I know of yet that I don't work with even understands this veneer that controls our life in such a profound way. And it blows me away to say this, but it literally is globally. So today I'm going to kind of point that out in an in what, it might be an interesting way to go about it. I hope the subject matter is important because it's, it can affect our lives in any moment. We touched, I've been touching on it here because of it's affecting our, our lives in the West with the fires and all. I'm going to touch a bit about this problem. And I'm going to tie uh, some... A question was asked to me, well, can you tie sustainable development to the fire policy? Can you tie Agenda 21 to this fire, the smoke that we're having? And I said, well, I can't do it in a document. I can do it in a way through how I know the words are there. You know, it's a word study. I don't know of one document. If there is a document, I haven't seen it. I'm not going to say it's not out there. And I would assume at some point we're going to find it. And so I'm going to have to take a little bit of a journey here, hopefully with you, to show you another way that our life is transparently controlled. And I hope by doing this, you'll see the fires in the West are arson. It's global, it's planned, and it's, there's a couple of identifiable groups and methods by which that is done in answering, can I connect up the smoke and the fires you see in the West to Agenda 21, or it's what they call sustainable development. And I'll remind you, and I'm going to cut back into this a lot later on in the broadcast when I get there, that the Bar Association House Delega Delegates Resolution told us, and I've done the prior broadcast for this reading from it, way back in 1993, that's a year after the introduction of this sustainable development, that they would promote it. So I'm not going to, that's where we're going to end up, we're going to start there and end up there. But the point is, can I show, and I can't do it in one document, but can I show a connection? I'm going to do hopefully more than that. I'm going to show you how you analyze how this process and method, which we sued in 2013 and got a default judgment on, uh, is it, it is your life. It is what you think you call government. It's not. It's a bunch of stakeholders in governance and control. And you all rail against centralized control, but you don't uh, fight it. You don't understand that it's actually there and functioning, and you misplace it to be a government. It's not yours. They call it adjunct. It's that reflexive so-called law. It's an opinion based on some well, uh, agenda. Uh, BTW RLM 279, I think this is. BTW RLM 279, for those on the past cast broadcast, want to search it out, find the content links. If you hear this somewhere else other than uh, reallibertymedia.com, which you can hear live at reallibertyradio.com, excuse me, RLM radio.xyz. And um, 
although I forgot to get in, I got, got kind of behind. Uh, freedomsnetwork.com is still looking for donations. However, I noticed a Bo Diddy had said, made a comment there might be a, some kind of a shift going on. So I'll ask those that uh, would donate there to keep the servers going. They're, that'll be do, they'll be coming down here within a few more weeks. Uh, we may need we're going to need your help again until we get a a, a much, bunch more donors. Or why don't you talk with Bo Diddy and freedomsnetwork.com and see what the deal is on, on that. As, as I don't want to see donations going to another thing that may be in a shift in trying to adjust to you know, what what support there is in trying to keep for platforms and venues available to those of myself and those of you all that are, are trying to work through the problems as I as we may find them and bring them. Uh, so uh, and to all those that mirror the message, MTM, thank you very much, all those that are doing the mirroring. And I, I ran across a portion of a mirroring, uh, 28 minutes of a discussion on the First Amendment auditor condition. I talked about Leon Valley. I thank you for doing that. A uh, few more people get to listen at that point that may not come to the uh, uh, RLM uh, YouTube, which I understand too. I'm, I noticed we're, we are all of us are more promoting like BitChute and Minds. Uh, although we come out of Spreaker to go to YouTube to get the transformation, I think we're once we get that we're we're transferring into BitChute because of the YouTube uh, the purge that continues. And you know we're still here, but and we're still there at YouTube, but we, you don't know how long that's going to be. So uh, this is the the war is on, and the war is on from these very same people. I'm going to indirectly I'm going to talk about that now about what I'm deeming at this point until something comes better in my mind as we find this in the west and anywhere else you know about fire you see around the world in Greece the Greece fire um, you know it's a, what we're going to find out is this is sustainable smoke is getting in your eyes and I might title the broadcast sustainable smoking gun ignites as we find out that there's a reason more than the altruistic excuses that were being given of why you're seeing the fires you do. And those of you that aren't in the West, if you have forest around you and it's and it's managed by by uh, the for the federal government anywhere around you, that means all across the country, United States, you have very big concern here. And I want you to really pay attention to how this is all working and how it's worked out against you since uh, at least the 80s. So if all you all think that since you learned you know, on the Internet since the 2000s and all, if you thought that, that no, you were, you've been outdone by that many decades already. And it took um, some of us, myself, looking into this thing, getting beyond uh, the patriots, getting beyond the constitutionalists, getting beyond, 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 cutting into and cutting beyond into what was really going on under underneath the skin of this that, it wasn't just the surface features. And uh, we, I think we've identified it for sure. We were, like I said, we sued it. It didn't answer. The judgment default. Now it's just a matter of getting you all to understand your life is controlled by handfuls of few people that are not actually doing law. And so I'm going to start here with the fires. I'm going to explain, I uh, hope uh, we go through this, how the fire policy that you are enjoying and will enjoy when your forests start to burn. Uh, it came from and has is guided by, uh, we'll call it sustainable development for the United States because that's how we know it. And over the pond on the uh, in Europe, they know it as Agenda 21. And we're going to start with uh, the, one of the states that has one of the biggest fires in the country right now, and they're going to blow this thing up beyond what it is. Uh, the, it's not the biggest because we're not in Redding. In Oregon, it's over in the... Um, They've split it up so they made it look smaller. It's almost, well, it doesn't matter how big it is. It's uh, the Klondike fire. But, but we go back and we wonder how did these uh, now reoccurring uh, extreme fires happen? And for those of us like myself, we've been looking at the, the Forest Service. Uh, they don't harvest anymore. The BLM very, doesn't harvest as, certainly as much. They call they have it under this new program, but it's really not that at all. It's about taking, it's, it ends up being a cult that believes that the Mother Earth is its own entity and the humans, the human, the animal of the human is is a is a scourge, and so you got to really twist your mind about how to understand what they're doing, and you can't rationalize it because it's really an insanity. It's a it's a religion, literally. When they go to calling you heretics because you don't agree what they agree, you kind of know that that's they're telling you the truth, and and you better place it there. But that's not the track I'm going down, and I'm not going to explain Agenda 21. I'm going to reference to it. I'm going to show you. 
that the reason why you've got smoke in your eyes in the West and you're going to have conflagrations uh, more and more is because it's actually a policy consideration not from your local people that understand and don't want the fire. It's from a national, an international body and its agents imposing these things through nat- what you look at as natural processes within the government you thought was yours. Uh, let me start with uh, a, a document from 2009. I'm going to read just a couple of these things. I'm not going to give you all the, the, the passages. There's so much that we can talk about. I'm never going to get to it. And I don't want to, I'm not going to give you all the documents I'm reading from because I'm back into a problem now where the, inform, the work that I do and that my colleagues do is being, is being uh, circumvented or undermined and the wrong answers are coming out or the incomplete answers are coming out instead of what the people are supposed to be doing. And this has happened to me for a long time. It's coming out again, in particular this fire policy. But because this fire thing is so, I mean, people die around this. Property damages occur around this. I'm going to keep some documents back. You're going to have to make your own trail. I want you to do that anyway, so you see a lot of what's going on here if you're interested. And I want you to look not on the subject matter just of the fires, but that there's this method underneath it that they use, and there's a ways to identify it, and I'm going to now drag, drag you through a little bit of a thing, how you identify it. The only way I know to do this is the way I end up doing it. I reverse engineered this whole thing and I because I noticed language was important on this. So we talk about this a, a lot it becomes very important uh, but you know them by you know you know them by the deeds you know them by the use of the words they use or the groupings of the words and so i'm going to just focus on a couple uh, in this issue here and i'm going to dr- show you how we go at universal application globally and that the same players will be involved and that your life is literally in the palm of their hands while you having the power literally it's in their documents that you do are not exercising that power to protect yourself against their theft they're, they're, it's a felony as far as I can tell it's treason actually, it works against your laws when you know how to look at this so I'm reading now uh, partially from the uh, Achieving Oregon's Vision for Federal Forest Lands Oregon Board of Forestry, January 2009 now I'm not going to I've got to look at some of this I'm going to kind of discuss some of it but some, some of it I can't uh, Oregon's vision is a problem the word vision, but federal forest lands there's no Oregon federal forest lands so we got a problem started out there's federal lands in for in Oregon, but Oregon possesses no federal forest lands. And this is the other thing I noticed about a recent bill. Uh, they uh, make it look like Oregon can get federal lands in their possession in order to make budgeting uh, bonds. Uh, and that's the complete violation. So they, they twist a lot of this thing. And we already see now a problem just in the title that this group of people got together and they make they they start off on the on the on the wrong foot. Let me read a couple of passages here. The Oregon Board of Forestry would like to thank the members of the For- Federal Forest Lands Advisory Committee, the FFAC, for their hard work in reaching consensus and developing the de- recommendations contained in this report. So it's a it's a report, recommendations by a group of people called an advisory committee that I've told you a long time ago, uh, advisory committees are defined in federal law, which means that they're, the, the, they're in the realm of the federal government, and they are defined merely as advisory to a federal agency. In other words, this Oregon Advisory Council is not the state's advisory council. It's working for, as a federal government advisor by definition. And so it's under the cover of this, and this I'm going to explain, this cover is what subverts your Tenth Amendment rights. It's what subverts the local power under the color of this authority. Now I got back to the felony again. So let me go down and read about that here. I've got to do quite a bit going on here, folks, so excuse me. Just a, again, the couple of periods, there's so much to read and show in between here and where I'm going right now about the people that are involved, well, like the Wildlife Conservancy. I mean, these are major global players on the on the destruction stage, uh, your li- lifestyle destruction stage. Let me read up. Uh, Forest health and sound stewardship are critical to Oregon's current and future well-being. Healthy federal forests are needed to sustain social, environmental, and economic values. Okay, I'm going to focus on that and not read more there. Let me just focus on you. Are you on this term? Social, 
environmental and economic values. And it's stated again by the time the Kulingowski in 2004, Governor Kulingowski stated this in this report, ensuring sustainable forests in Oregon requires that we understand that the social, environmental, and economic benefits of forests are not only important, but also interconnected. We have to get past the costly conflict over our forests and craft the public policy model that is described in the forest program for Oregon. So we got the clue, the, the, the little words in there as well, sustainable. We have the phrase, the term, social, environmental, and economic. So this is a consideration I want to show you. We want to focus on that term. We're also going to want to focus on how they put this together. And what's the method and who was involved. And just keep those in the back of our mind. This document sets forth a vision, a set of key goals that should be pursued on federal forest lands to create forests that are ecolog ecologically sustainable, economically viable, and appreciated by all stakeholders. I need to tell you and remind you that stakeholder is like Genghis Khan and his horde threatening you. It's not you. It's only those that are going to be involved in moving the vision and, the fo and promoting the goals for sustainable forests. Remember, this is the state of Oregon, supposedly, actually talking about lands that are not actually theirs. It's within, the federal lands in hold the state, but are not owned or controlled by the state. And this is critical to you, for you to understand, as I tell you, about the land disposal laws, and that the state is not supposed to own any of these lands. They're supposed to be disposed to the people or those under the law that have the right to claim them as disposed by Congress under its obligations underneath its, the state's enabling act. Federal forest lands in Oregon are a legacy, a refuge, and a resource, loved and celebrated by our citizens, inhabited by healthy populations of fish and wildlife, and managed with humility, wisdom, and innovation to sustain the economic, environmental, social, and cultural well-being of rural and urban communities. Did you hear people being mentioned there, folks? But we have the phrase economic, environmental, and social. Now the order's been changed, but the things are there. So just keep those in terms in mind. We're going to just go through and find out where else are these things talked about. One more point I want to go do, state on this document. Again, this is a many page, a 69 page document, so I'm, not, I'm just going to point out the high spots. It's right in the beginning. We don't have to go far to see the connection, and so that's why I just want to reference you to this. Environment, the very first thing. Our goals to achieve the vision is environment. Forest rangeland ecosystems are protected, restored, and managed for a full range of sustainable ecosystem benefits within the context of climate change. All right, so I just wanted to start stop there because this will be the themes as we go through and see the consistency. Who speaks like this? Whose objectives and goals are like this? Can we find distinctions in other places? And so I want to keep climate change in the back of our mind. And so we want to do some just word checking. What, what this was that pulled this together, how, how these stakeholders work, is through what they would call a collaboration. Let me move on one more. Social. So here the very first thing is environment. Number one is the environment here, folks. It's not production. It's not your well-being. It's the environment. Number two here is social. Forest, for, uh, federal forest lands. We're not talking about Oregon's forest lands. They're talking about federal forest lands. They, the Oregon state doesn't know, which means that they're not talking about Oregon. These are not people that are actually supporting Oregon. They're supporting an agenda, and they've got the mechanism, the method in place that state agreed to, adopted, internal to the system. The social angle on this, remember, environmental, social, and economic. And who? And we're going to look at those three words, and where can we find it? It's federal, federal forest lands respond to site-specific variations in community-based management principles taking into consideration tribal, local, state, 
and national needs and priorities. Management provides opportunities for people to realize their material, spiritual, and recreational values and relationships with the forest. Forest, federal forest land management rebuilds and maintains trust within affected communities using collaboration, adaptive management, and another and other innovative strategies. Now, those of you who listen to me, you've heard all these words before. Uh, you've heard me talk about how how they are used to harm you. Let me just focus this arse on today on collaboration. This is how these stakeholders get and these agencies work together. And we're going to find out what that actually is, and you can find out here that they're determining something for y'all and what you're going to use in the federal forest lands. Uh, you didn't hear anything about production, did you? No. You're going to realize your material, spiritual, and recreational values. And they're going to do it by a collaborative and adaptive management process. That's that amoeba I keep telling you about. So that's what I want. That's all I need to say right here. I, I'm not going to read more on that. You can find this. One in the, I think I'll put this link in so you get to see where we start. And now let me go in and, and well, let me do some research and let me plug in the, these these terms that we keep finding over and over and over, like a mantra, right? These same same three things: economics. Economic, environmental, and social. Let's type that in. And what come, one of the documents that'll pop up? Just and this is all just reference to show you where we're going. I wanted to get there a little quick. Human Development Reports, United Nations Development Program, Sustainable Development Dashboard Two. Sustainable Development Dashboard contains a selection of indicators that cover environmental, economic, and social sustainable development. So what I want to point out here is when they talk about these three items together, environmental, economic, and social, they're talking about sustainable development. They're re-speaking this at the UN. And then they give us some examples. And I want to go to the examples because I want to point back to the beginning document to show that this is a consistent, what that they speak in this 2009 document to something you can find that was printed in 2016 that shows it's a continuum. For environmental sustainability, a mix, of, a mix of level and change indicators is related to renewable energy consumption, carbon dioxide emissions, forest areas, and fresh water withdrawals. Let me go back to the beginning document. And didn't we talk about, they mentioned in, in their document there, in environment, number one, we think this is an accident, Consistent says, number one, the very first priority is forest and rangeland ecosystems, not watersheds here, if you know these other terms that are there, but let me just read it. Forest and rangeland ecosystems are protected, restored, and managed for a full range of sustainable ecosystem benefits within the context of climate change. Let's go back. What is? But what is uh, carbon dioxide emissions but tied to this fraud? of climate change as a term. Remember, it's not what climate does. It's a term of art and a weapon. So in the back of our mind, we're holding the term climate change. It is integrated with the UN purpose where you find this combination, environmental, economic, and social considerations. Now, you and I may think that these are, oh, these are great great things. Why wouldn't we want to look out for protecting the environment, economics, or social? But this is in context of preserving Gaia, not you. You are the enemy. You are the problem. Uh, so I don't want to bore that too much down on that. I, we talk about that. But that you got it to keep track of how this works. Eventually we get to the point of how it's applying to make to reason why is the forests burning up more? Why are is there so much smoke? Why don't they care for you? Well, they never started caring for you in this in this con- in this condition, and so we have a connection. Though, when you use the words economic, environmental, and social, it's a consistent term that's used by the UN itself. Let's look at now wildfires in particular. Given we were talking at the state of Oregon's forestry issue and how they want to do all this together. 
And we want to know, what, again, relative to fires, how can we make this fire policy that we see, the, the national fire, fire policy, how is it relevant to uh, sustainable development? I mean, how can it be connected? Well, look around. You put in the term social, economic, and environmental, and up, you'll find, up pops an assessing the environmental, social, and economic impacts of wildfire. This was created in 2003. For those of you thinking everything just happening now, remember, this is a, a build-up before it got to 2003. So there was a lot of mechanisms running before we even get there. It was made by uh, from Yale University School of Forestry and, don't ever disregard the ands, those are conjunctive, these tied things together. It's no longer forestry on its own like production. No, it's tied to these econo environmental considerations. Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, Global Institute of Sustainable Forestry. Okay? This is a project was supported by a grant from the American Forest and Paper Association, which brings up a whole other issue of the industry actually cutting its own throat. But let's go back to the title, Assessing the Environmental, Social, and Economic Impacts of Wildfire. So now they've done the three-word term that the UN recognizes as a sustainable development, and now they're looking at that impacts impacts on those by wildfire, actually. And so we have a connection. They're doing an analysis. This is 2003, six years before the report gets done. And they make comments in here, again, relative to the ter three-word term that we're using which, uh, again, I've got to go through here quick, quickly, which uh, the introduction of which says environmental, economic, and social impacts from wildfire in the United States have been steadily increasing over the past decade, culminating with several large and costly, wild fi costly fires in 2000, 2001, and 2002. These fires uh, not only consumed forests and rangeland vegetation, but also adversely impacted wildlife habitat, recreation, and tourism, water quality and supply, and property values, all of which depend on forested landscape. We'll put that little word, landscape, in the back of your mind. We're not going to touch it too much, but this is what they work. They don't work in the watershed. And the laws work in the watershed. Although federal and state agencies keep records of total acres burned, structures destroyed, and fire suppression cost data on indirect and continuing impacts of wildfire are rarely calculated. However, these impacts, such as restoration costs, alteration of habit wildlife habitat, lost tourism revenue, and human health effects, are important components of risk assessment and wildfire management. In collaboration with the American Forest and Paper Association, the Global Institute of Sustainable Forestry at, a, at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies have collected and summarized available national and state level data for a variety of wildfire impacts for the past three years. I'll stop there. Now we see the scope of this assessment using those three words is global. This is not confined to the United States. This is not confined to Oregon. This is not confined to the United States. It's not confined uh, to any place limited by the to the globe. This is a policy assessment. This is like insurance against the, the this effect against what their agenda is looking at the term social, environmental, and economic. A collaboration was done to create this report, which did an assessment on those impacts. And you can read the report. Again, all these reports are fascinating when you go through and you see how they're talking. It, it opens up the whole of more deep dynamic and understanding. I'm, I don't have the time to do that today. I'm just trying to show you how you go back and show that these policies in the United States are set up, firefighting policies are set up underneath the auspices and control and continued control of a foreign body. And they disregard the, where, where they get away with it, where appropriate, where they get away with it, it rules your areas, your locales. It sets the policy on how fires will be uh, continued, started, and, and kept going, or not. And right now the policy is, it's been said to be let it burn, but it's also you know, keep it, uh, let it burn, keep it burn, and get it burning. Okay? Uh, so we got to look at that as well. So 
we now have the connection, local connection in terms to a state, looking at an assessment that was done before that, using the same terms, recognizing fires within that state as well. As a matter of fact, like the burnt biscuit, the biscuit fire was in there. That's half a million acres, folks, burnt. All the animals that died in that fire, all the timber that was lost, uh, the supposed w w wilderness that was destroyed, and that's natural. See, they don't care about that because it's natural. It's Gaia doing her thing. There, but the more important thing is that there's no people in there anymore. Now, they'll tell you that you can't go in there. That's a lie, and it's going to take local authorities to figure out what their power is to re-engage that and kick them out and get back in control of even the wildlife areas. But this assessment talks about economic, excuse me, environmental, economic, and social. Again, the three-word term. All I'm doing is I'm searching documents relative to fire, relative to the potential connection to the UN. We have it in, connected also to the, uh, the goal of pushing climate change. I'm not going to touch the climate change more than we're looking at terms of consistent uh, use for the purposes of identifying who's in control. Who are these people relying on that you think are your representatives or your agencies or looking out your, for your best interest, and what do they do? Oh, we'll go right now to the U.S. Forest Service. Wildfire triage, targeting mitigated, mitigation based on social, economic, and ecological values. So what, first of all, we're connected again to the terminology that's global, global forestry. And you got to hope in your mind you say, well, who are these people from somewhere else interested in your forests. And I, and I don't know if you appreciate that they are your forests and they are being only being managed. And there's a production that comes from them and it doesn't look like it directly. It's not a direct effect to you, but it indirectly and in the West, it can in certain areas uh, help pay the pay for the is money to the, to the general fund, which allows, when this was working for production, not conservation in the non-use stage, it actually made allowed uh, places to not have to pay property taxes. It was no different than what the subsidies you might hear coming out of the, out of, from oil out of Alaska. It's a resource that goes to the people. Eventually, the, the people uh, benefit. And so, but here's this wildfire triage targeting mitigation based on Social, economic, and ecological values is, is a connection to the UN again, a connection back to the Oregon uh, report of what they want to promote, and it's based on those three. How come it's not based on something else? Should be another consideration. That why are they focusing just on this, and why is it a triage? A uh, little stare paragraph here kind of told the tale of the tape if you didn't understand uh, what's really going on and that they're not really in the capacity to fulfill this more than an administrative issue, I mean uh, collaborative uh, treatment. The adage that hindsight is twenty twenty may seem especially fitting during the days and weeks after the wildfire threatens or destroys valuable resources. Each field season, land managers face tough decisions of where to implement prescribed burns, timber sales, thinning projects, and other efforts designed to mitigate hazardous fuel conditions and reduce the risk of uncharacteristic wildfire, fire that does not occur within the time and space and severity patterns of the historical natural fire regime with constrained budgets and personnel limiting their capacity. I would say that last bit is your uh, understanding. It should be you're in as a local, a local official. When they're still admitting right here in this document, the Forest Service, We'll you look at considerations for mitigating through this pro, uh, mitigating the impacts on uh, social, economic, and, uh, and environmental agenda that they have limited constrained budgets and limited personnel and capacity. That is your acknowledgement by from them that you have a job to do. You have you can use that limitation in them to step up and stop the look solely through the lens the United United Nations lens of social and economic and econo ecological values. You also have your production values, your law values, if I can put it in their terms. You also have the foundation and principles of your country and your locale to protect as a fiduciary duty to your people. But the point is the Forest Service utilizes the same verbiage, social, economic, and ecological, and they look at their policy through this, uh, what we find now connected to the UN 
condition and connected to climate change. And so these are all integrated, but they, I want you to remind you these are all just an excuse. I, I'm not, I don't have to believe in them or not. I can just tell you that this is an integrated condition, and we're trying to find out whether or not your local, your, your national forest policy is consistent with a foreign imposition wanting to control global forests globally. And when you see the policy that they want to do it because they're protecting Gaia from you. Let's look at now. So now we see the Forest Service itself admits to utilizing its analyses through this term, social, environmental, and economic constraints. Let's look and see now what those three words actually work, their function in the world. And I found a little website which concisely explains this. They're actually pretty upset about the fact that it's limited, uh, and, they, and they want to get it. They want to be worse, but uh, I'll use it because uh, this website, because it uh, concisely explains what these three words are in the context of the global imposition that's been adopted by your national agencies, and then again by your so-called state collaborators through that first forest vision for property that's not the state's. So you gotta, if you keep all these things track, you realize this is like a major crime going on here. But they're relying on something. So I'm going to go back to this point. What are these three words? Economic, social, environmental. Well, they happen to be the three pillars of sustainability. Not only are they a part of sustainable development, which the UN acknowledges, they are the pillars of sustainable development. They're a powerful tool for defining the complete sustainability problem. This consists of at least the economic, social, and environmental pillars. And this is critical to see these words. Again, the word pillar pops up. Put that in the back of your mind. If any one pillar is weak, then the system as a whole is unsustainable. Well, that for us is a clue. But that for them is how they can define what sustainable is. In other words, you're get, removing it from their control area. That's what they call unsustainable, that you interfere with what their agenda is on those three pillars. The three pillars. They're foundational to uphold the roof of this agenda. You knock one out, then you start to weaken it. And it's what you're weakening is the global sustainability or sustainable development in position. Two popular ways to visualize the three pillars are shown and what they show is a Venn diagram the three circles, one of environment, social, and economic placed over each other in, in equidistant and then they show the interaction sections the Venn diagram shows the interaction areas and they have each one labeled and then right in the center is that when they match these three uh, pillars or principles of the agenda then you have a sustainable condition and any other when they, any of the three get out of balance, you move through the inner the inner um, core of it, which means if it's not sustainable, it may be bearable, it may be equitable, and it may be viable, but it's not sustainable. So you've got three more words to kind of put in the back of your mind that you hear a lot. You don't hear bearable so much; you hear viable or equitable. But so anyway, we get to the point. Let's add now who uses this these three pillars to get us back into the utility of these policies that uh, we now look at, they blame, uh, they claim that climate change, and is again, the tool and the weapon, is the cause of the smoke and the fires. And I'm trying to show you, and uh, responding to someone who asked the question, can you tie this, the fire policy to, to Agenda 21? We'll get to the fire policy here in a bit, uh, but we have to kind of go through this. Who, why is it there? Who's doing it? These terms are being used by whom, what, when, and what do they mean? Uh, most national and international problem-solving efforts focus on only one pillar at a time. For example, the United Nations Environmental Program, or UNEP, the Environmental Protection Agency's EPA of many nations, and the environmental and NGOs focus on the environmental pillar. The uh, Real Trade Organization uh, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development focus mostly on economic growth, uh, thought that OED, OECD gives some attention to social sustainability, 
like war reduction and justice. The United Nations attempts to strengthen all three pillars, but due to its consensual decisions, makes process and uh, make decision-making process and small budgets has a minor impact. The United Nations focuses most on the economic pillar, since economic growth is what most of its members want most, especially developing nations. So, go back to the point. This is a United Nations driven. The EPAs of your nations are what do the environmental pillar. So let's go maybe look at that. Look at the now. Let's look at these this term these terms social, environmental, and economic, and see if they're tied to the EPA of the United States sustainability assessment and management process tools and indicators. Elements of sustainability assessment and management. Embedded in the general sustainability framework recommended by the Committee of Incorporated Sustainability in the U.S. EPA is an approach to incorporating sustainability to inform decision-making. Remember, informed decision-making is part of the collaborative process. This article goes on to stay here to explain some of this. It is in it is called sustainability assessment and management and is illustrated in the level in the chapter uh, in the figure in the chapter this chapter describes the steps involved in the approach beginning with a screening evaluation to determine whether the, to conduct the sustainability assessment and management process and to determine the appropriate le level of effort or depth of such assessment this step is followed by problem definition and scoping and for those of you that get involved with public comments in this process, you're going to hear these terms. The scoping process is the first thing they do. So they're explaining the EPA, who has control of the environmental pillar in the United States and acts as a central figure in how policy is made in everything the agencies do, and this is the connection for it, that... They, you, they're telling you how they go about doing this, and you will hear, those of you that have ever done this, you're hearing the terms that you'll use when you go to public comments. You'll see the notices come out, the scoping meeting, this and that and the other. This is what we're talking about. This is part of that process. This is part of the process who's the myopic view to promote social, environmental, and economic pillars of a UN objective called sustainable development. After they do this scoping, or they, they define the scoping, this includes identification of options, preliminary scoping of the analysis, stakeholder involvement, and opportunities for collaboration. Remember I told you to keep that word in the back of your mind. Collaboration, collaborative, cooperation, and cooperative is this process. Where they use stakeholders. Did you hear producers in there? Did you hear landowners? Did you hear anything to do with production and your land laws? So they don't include the people they're going to adversely affect. As I've identified to you and how I got to there, these people under the color of this official authority who do that are, are felons. But it says it right here. We can read in their own documents that the EPA is integral in this process. Then they lay out how they go about to go about doing what they do. It's, again, this is nothing that's secret. And once you start to pick this up, you'll see this. I just said globally. If you live in the world, this affects you. And this is affecting you adversely. And everywhere I find this thing touches, it's like, it's like cancer. So let's get to a point down again. I can't go through the whole thing, and it would be boring as heck. I mean, this is the other thing. Your eyes will roll back and dry up before you... You got to kind of pour through this stuff. But let me get down to those key features. This is what I'm trying to do for y'all. Point you to the points. You start from there, and if you're willing to, if you really want to do some changing, you really want to stop whining about the harm that's coming on you. You understand these processes, and you'll begin to start to do that. The sustainability assessment and management process should incorporate certain key features. And again, this is a guidance that the EPA uses to impose upon you these three pillars of a UN origination. One, comprehensive and systems-based analysis of alternative options should include an integrated evaluation of the social, environmental, and economic consequences. 
I have to interject. That's those consequences. You say, oh, that's great. They should do that. But that's those contents, context, uh, consequences as figured through climate change. And it's figured through all the other goals that sustainable development is as controlled by those that are in the collaborative process, those agencies in the collaborative process. You're already outside of judicial and you're outside of lawmaking. Inside the process, it's controlled by those things. In other words, the system and process, if you don't agree that this is the limit and how we're going to approach it, connecting to climate change and everything else, you don't get to participate. Number two, intergenerational. The long-term consequences of alternatives should be evaluated in addition to their more immediate consequences. This, in, in sustained speak, is they're looking like the amoeba analyzing the future of the consequence of what they do now and how it's going to impact what they do against you. And so they put this as part of the analysis, step two. First, they identify that they got to look within the social, environmental, economic context. Then they find out whether or not these actions are going to, by their options they choose and the alternatives they choose ahead of time. Again, the self-inflicted wound on you. You walk right into this wall. They uh, analyze ahead of time whether what the comp potential consequences are. Number three is how this process should be worked. Is you use stakeholder involvement and collaboration. Remember I told you, it was part of that document from Oregon in 2009, speaking to how they were going to manage the federal forests. What they would accept. And this state statement is, stakeholders should be involved throughout the process. But if you looked ahead, you saw that the stakeholders didn't include landowners or property owners, private property owners, producers, or anybody else. Governments. They talk about local governments, but they talk about through the process. In other words, if you're not a local government that's involved in agreeing to the co collaboration, you don't have a say, or you're told you don't have a say, and this is the big disconnect. You still have a say, you just have to say it differently. And you'd say it more authoritatively, and you have more teeth, but you don't, most people don't know that today. And I'm not, I'm not, see, my, I want you to be educated here on this, so that you can recognize this, uh, this plunder, this, this corruption, and uh, if you can't help on your own, you can get with others to go help, and go speak to the people in the seat of decision right now. They have the power at the local county. They just don't understand that. And they feel like they've got to listen to the attorneys. And we're going to get to that point and that problem as well. So that, they lay out for us what their object in applying the sustainability assessment. And the assessment, really, when you look at what they're doing, it's a demand against you and your, your stuff and your laws and your existence and your way of life. And they're assessing how that impacts them when they apply that to you and your response. And if you don't come up with the right response, they say, good, we're going to push it through it. It's appropriate, where appropriate, it's appropriate when no one sees us coming or we're transparent to them. Okay, you've heard these transparency stuff. I talked about it before. And so they explain now, and I'm going to read a little bit longer passage, and we'll now hear, listen for, all the terms that I've been speaking of up until now, integrated together. We see all the use of the terms used by the United States EPA, again, to tie back to the, consist the consistency with which the UN uses these terms on a global level. They're called integrated assessment models. Integrated assessment models. So this, is in this concept of integration is all important. You heard the word inclusive? Yeah, it's integrated. It's integrated into their method. And these models, remember, these are models. These are just constructions. They're not tested or anything else. Integrated assessments cross discipl disciplinary lines to merge theory and data from multiple disciplines to address complex environmental issues. Remember, this is just one of the pillars. They do the very same thing in, uh, on the other, other two. Modeling is the standard tool used by conducting an integrated assessment. Maybe interject. Nothing in reality. It's all based in models. Remember, that's what climate change is pr predicated on, and that's just a relationship, right? So we're seeing the integration of the action also with the words. Here it is, more words. Integrated assessment models such as the global change assessment model. You know, these people are overseeing the entire globe. Arose in the study of climate change 
bringing together global circulation models and economic models to assess the probable benefits and costs of alternative energy and climate policy choices. I may have to remind you, remember we said climate change was in the very first document that was adopted by Oregon on how they were going to manage their forests. This happens to be what? We talked about carbon emissions. What does that bring up but the carbon market? How else do they get to have see global circulation models for econ and economic models but through the carbon tax plunder? So they say right here the EPA is actually integrating these processes. Although typically not called integrated assessment models, models used for ecosystem services valuation are also examples that integrated models from multiple disciplines to assess the benefits and costs of alternative policy choices. And let me offer these ecosystem services valuation is what we found leading into our lawsuit in 2013 when I noticed I was waiting for the money for ecosystem services, they created the black hole funding system, the multiple multiple leveraged funding system. And I said, that's what we went in and sued. When they funded this nonsense, we went after the money. That was the let, and, they, and I'm, I'm sure they knew we were looking at it, and it didn't go to the bleeding edge of the session in that that year because I thought I think that they didn't. They realized that they we were looking for it, and they didn't want to put it in too soon. And then they had to then they had to get it in, otherwise they couldn't fund all this stuff that they had done. And when it went in, we went through that. But it was based in ecosystem services and the funding of that. So here it is. It's part of the system that they do. In fact, the EPA was in the backside of that lawsuit because they do grant stream funding. That's what they're talking about here at Ecosystem Services Valuation. Now, I know these words don't sound the same, but this is how they function. This is why you have to have the right ears to hear this. It's why you have to read their documents for as eye-drying as it is if you intend to stop the nonsense against you. Those of you in the areas that could be burning, you need to know this. Those of you in areas that are burning, you need to know this so you get on your, on your local uh, officials. To strengthen an integrated assessment is that they combine knowledge and multiple disciplines needed to understand how human actions might affect the system in important ways. You're, you're an antagonist, you humans, you animals. E.g., greenhouse gas emissions in the climate system. That's their whole focus. It's a pretty cool weapon what they did there because they went after your, your very environment. Integrated assessments often take an expansive and long-term view, which is suitable for sustainability analysis. Integrated assessment models are often complex, tending to make them non-transparent to non-experts. I thought that was fascinating. Non-transparent to non-experts. When in fact the transparency is they're talking about you not seeing what they do. Integrated assessments model are often complex, tending to make them non-transparent to non-experts. You can't see them. How's that? They're also dry. I tell you, they dry your eyes reading them. But they're all working on a plan. And here's another thing coming up on what their plan is to do. Furthermore, this is getting near the end of this paragraph here. Outcomes can be sensitive to modeling assumptions for that might have inadequate factual basis for clearly determining the right assumption to use. In other words, how to make it transparent to you. They may make a mistake. Their model may not cover for what? The outcome. But that word in the back of your mind, uh, that's another word that continues to pop up with this in, uh, the consistency of the language being used of who's using it. Still integrated assessment, still integrated assessment models will often be needed to understand the relationship among the social environmental, and economic pillars of sustainability in the context of a particular decision. Now, what did I say? Consistency in the terminology. The EPA now is doing a tool model of assessment that is focused on bringing social, environmental, and economic pillars of sustainability together while they enforce climate change. 
I'm looking here quickly to see if I want to read more because it is kind of dry, and I do because it examples something here that I need. It's very important. It becomes the counterpoint. And they admit this is not the law. This is different than the law. But they still are going to promote it. This is your EPA agency talking about how they do this, how they do this to you. Sustainability impact assessment is used to analyze the probable effects, the probable effects of a particular project or proposal on the social, environmental, and economic pillars of sustainability. In other words, how does a plan that someone might make affect them? If you understand how to start thinking about this, this is not for you. This is how are they going to? How does the things that are going on in the world affect what they want to get done? This assessment is also used to develop integrated policies that, quote, take full account of the three sustainable development dimensions, which are what, folks? The three pillars, economic, environment, and social. It takes full account of these. The you know, EPA takes full account of these, of these things and include the cross-cutting, intangible, long-term considerations. Well, one of the cross-cutting things they're doing is cross-cutting across your branches of government. So they plan to subvert your government, and they impose governance. Sustainability impact assessment is used in many European countries and in Canada, but has not been used to the any great extent in the United States. They're going to bring it in by this report, is what this thing is about. Let me finish this off. Sustainability impact assessments is a modeled on, but different from, environmental impact assessments, which was pioneered in the United States through the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, and is now used widely around the world. No one uses the NEPA, and we'll find out why when I show it to you, or at least point some things out. But they are focused on putting this through despite the National Environmental Policy Act. They say it's different from the Act of Congress, which actually looks over the property and attempts to bring a balance between what we do as people in the world and what we do to the world we live in. It's not one-sided. Environmental uh, social aspects of sustainable development in the United States of America. This gotten from a UN document, and I find interesting the the, the saying that sustainable the Agenda 21 sites down at the UN at this day. I couldn't get any documents off, so I had to do some surrogates. But this one was important. Social aspects of sustainable development in the United States of America. Why are they even considering on the United States of America, folks? I thought we were different, distinct, the beacon, and separate, and all that stuff. Well, not in that, not in this, not in this reality. You are not different by 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 design. You are a part of the hive, and you will act sustainably. You will behave sustainably. But this was interesting because this is where I start to see if you didn't believe me that sustainable development is Agenda 21. The UN website talking about social aspects of sustainable development in the United States actually has it as a subfolder in Agenda 21. All right? So here we have a connection starting to build that we're not, again, in a different way, that we're talking about the same thing. Sustainable development is in position, is imposing, is moving forward, promoting, advancing Agenda 21. And if you want to know about it, there's plenty of people talking about it on the Internet. Search it out. Plenty of good people will talk better than I will on it. I could care less. I know it's there. It's a weapon. That's all I needed to know about it years and years and years ago, folks. Really. It's like uh, like 9-11. It happened. They'd done it. Now what? Now what are we going to do? Well, let's go down to education because education becomes a problem for us when that becomes the goal to educate you. And what are they? who's going to do it and how? The United States Environmental Protection Agency uh, Office of Environmental Education is a full member of the National Coordinating Body for Sustainable Development and is responsible for edu environmental education activities. The National Environmental Education Advisory Council, oh, another advisory council, provides the administrator of EPA with the independent advice on how the ad ad agency implements the National Environmental Education Act. You didn't hear NEPA there, did you? No, this Education Act. 
The council serves as an important communication mechanism which links the federal government to educators around the country. And that's just not your teachers. Is whoever steps into the capacity to promote sustainable development. So be careful on how you pigeonhole who you think's working here in, in this regard. It ends up being you're infiltrated and surrounded. Again, advisory council is an advisor to an agency. The state's advisory council to the forest vision of Oregon was an agency function of the federal government. Confirmation right here in the utility. Although the EPA is not directly involved in a national strategy of education, it has been involved with the National Science and Technology Committee's commi uh, Council's Committee of Education and Training. According to the President Count President's Council for Sustainable Development, let me retract, step back, look at that again. According to the President's Council for Sustainable Development, those of you in the United States don't think it's in the government already, you think it's all a hoax, you think this is a fraud, a, a conspiracy theory, you think it doesn't affect you, no, this is at the top office of the executive. It's an office, it's a council, excuse me. It's a task force, another term of art here, Always throw that in the back of your own. And working groups, another one, while well, I'm on the task force. Whenever you see task force and working group, you know these are the collaborators that are destroying your, your, your life. The task force and public linkage, capital letters here, folks. This is the President's Council for Sustainable Development Task Force on Public Linkage, Dialogue, and Education. Well, what dialogue? Dialogue to what? Consensus. This is the consensus process. Dialogue and education, quote, an, uned, an, educator, an educated public is our most powerful resource to meet the challenges created by the increasing environmental, economic, and social demands. There's the truth. These, these three pillars are a demand on you. And if you're educated... You will not be a resistance to that. You will just agree to the demands for your behavioral change. And this EPA is to make sure that you they have an educated public, that you'll accept or even buy in to what they have to sell. This education becomes critical to understand it's connected. This process of educating you to the, they hear it now, the new normal, how long have I been telling you that, it's critical to understanding connection with the other things that are involved and when you see that a collaboration process, a cooperative process, a cooperation process of things that are social, envir environmental, economic, or the word sustainable, or sustainable development. You see all these conditions coming together in one document. You, well, I guess you could deny it. You could be a denier. But, but uh, this all comes from one agreed source, and the United States government's offices and the highest executive office agrees to the implementation through these mechanisms. And part of the reason why it's not a, a, a policy, excuse me, a law of implementation, because it's counter to the law. They can just bring it in as policy considerations and execution of policy. And that is a key to understand how it's defeated. How we do it all the time. When I say you bring the law, the objective basis, you defeat all of this. And, and unless you do that, you are going to be defeated by it. And the demands, they tell you right here, the demands are going to be put on you by this, by these three pillars. From what source, folks? The United Nations Global Authority, which can be sized up in something they call Agenda 21. And how do I know that? If I didn't know more, the Bar Association told me in their documents. There's House Resolution Delegation explained that they kind of frauded, defrauded people, didn't disclose certain things. They did it on purpose. In Europe, it was Agenda 21, but the United States, they may have been a little too savvy. Maybe they didn't want to, they wouldn't agree to something that was foreign sounding, Agenda 21. So, they call, so the Bar Association promoted the fact that it was only sustainable development. But it's actually Agenda 21. Agenda 21 is a non-binding. Here's your outs, folks. This is how you, you attack all this eventually. All these policies can't be law. And this says right here it's non-binding. Why? Because it was never made law in the United States. 
It's why the laws don't speak to it, but the policy can be implemented over it. As long as what? As long as they don't do any violations to those things that are uh, prohibited. Unless otherwise prohibited. It's the savings clauses I keep telling you about are there to protect us if we would just start to use them and not deny them. Agenda 21 is a non-binding action plan. Action plan. I tell you, you got to have your evolutionary action. Revolutionary engagement. They have their action plan. You better have one for you. Of the United Nations with regard to sustainable development. Here's the connection. It is the product of the Earth Summit, the UN Conference on Environmental Environment and Development. Who are these people developing your environment? you got to start asking these questions too. Held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, 1992. The 21 in Agenda 21 refers to the 21st century. I'm just going to cut through here. Anybody who knows this already, I'm just boring you. If you don't, you need. I'm just looking at the wiki, folks. It's all you can just read the wiki and see what this is about. But let me get to our our, our point. The agenda 21 is 350 pages long. I talk about it, roll your eyes back and dry them out, like 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 any desert, the sunshine baking on your eyes, dry them out into leather balls. But you got to read this stuff to see what the enemy is about. And they talk section one of this document talks on social and economic dimensions. It's an environmental document. So you have the three right there in Section 1, implied. And then they make sure that they talk about Section 2 in conservation and management of resources. That conservation has nothing to do with production. It's atmospheric protection, combating deforestation, protecting vi- fragile environment, conservation of biological diversity. This is really the, the big deal. The Biological Diversity Treaty is underlying this whole thing. Control of pollution and the management of biotechnology. And I hear a lot of people that are, I'm singing to the choir here. You're talking about well, what do they do with geo uh, uh, geo geoengineering? Yeah, this is all the big anomaly, the big problem. These people are advancing on you. Strengthening the role of major groups includes the roles of children and youth, women, NGOs, local authorities. See, women, children, and the indigenous are an excuse. It's a human shield. They say strengthening the role of major groups, but you have to do it as a stakeholder inside the system that promotes social, environmental, and economic agenda or sustainable development under the agenda called, well, under the program called Agenda 21. Development and evolution, the full full text of Agenda 21 was made public on the UN Conference Environment and Development Earth Summit. Again, that's the notice that they had to us. What let me go down here. There's another thing I wanted to point out. The regional levels. Now they talk in regional levels. This is one of their terms. Keep that in the back of your mind. Whenever you talk about regions or metros, this is all integrated that way. Integrated. Now regionally, we talk regionally because you're going to look at the documents. Talk regionally. Now, the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs Division for Sustainable Development monitors and evaluates progress nation by nation towards the adoption of Agenda 21 and makes these reports available to the public on its website. It's important we go to that doc, uh, uh, an issuance of that com- that uh, agency and this is where we make that connection. You know, well, what are these group, these international groups and they do all this sustainable development? How does it get back to my forests? So I went a little bit off path to show you where sustainable development is talked about, how they talk about it, who's talking about it. It's in your nation, the United States. And now how do we... And then you talk, you can hear, they are sitting like global overseers. If you haven't got that, get that now. There's the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. They're talking, the United the EPA is picking this up as, a, as, a, as the overseer that they're implementing that program. They're not working for you and they're not working for the United States government. They're working to promote this agenda with the UN overseers. And so we go to one of their documents and relative, relevant to forests, to see the integration of these three pillars with this and the com- continued enforcement through what collaborative processes, cons- all the way down to the local state, subverting the local government. The state down to the local is now subverted. Uh, we see United Nations Economic and Social Council produced a document. Summary of this paper, this, the present report sets out a conclusion and recommendations for consideration of all United Nations forum and forests, uh, forum on forests and addressing key challenges in the context of the overall theme of the 10th session, forests and economic development. Based mainly on the report of the Secretary General entitled 
forests and economic development. Forests make significant contributions to international trade and economies, provide vital subsistence benefits, and constitute reservoirs of social, economic, and environmental values. So these people are highly consistent. They're now looking at global forests, and they have their finger inside. They get their hands in your forests. Where'd they get that authority? Well, it doesn't exist, because if you listen very carefully, these are conclusions or recommendations made by who? For consideration of those in the forum. Not for law or for actual, actual application. Now, who are these people? is my first question, but then they go and they do this imposition of the three pillars of a foreign policy that I already know is contrary to our laws, and we assert that because this policy is different than our own National Environmental Policy Act, which I know, when you read it, it makes provisions for man's, the world of mankind in harmony, not as an opposition to the nature, the, the nature in which he exists and is a part of, not in dis- difference to. Uh, This report statement summary goes on. After mentioning social and economic values, again, the term we found in the Oregon document, now why is this all consistent? If this is foreign, it's not. It's consistent. The range of policy actions include promoting cross-sectoral and cross-institutional collaboration. These big words, nonsense words, but if you understand what you're looking at, you're looking at the layers of the infiltration. In order to further enhance the contributions of forests to economic development, let me me just stop there. The United States laws provide for intensive, productive use of their forests already. Why are they imposing economic development on something that's supposed to already be wealth-driving, not debt-centric, as their agenda does. Remember, sustainable de- debt is sitting underneath here as well. Why do they want to impose over our good law in the United States of America their failed economic development policy? But this is to further that. A number of actions and policies are needed at the local and national international level. That is a notice that the United Nations, for interfering your policy, your forests, has to get the locals to agree. And where they have to get the locals to agree, the locals don't have to. Is I guess my interjection right here. If you understand, if you start reading this for the ins on how you circumvent this, I just gave you an insight on how you do it. When they're saying they need to get the permission, they're telling you they need to get your local your local consent, which directs us to local action. What did William Roberts say? Come vocal local. Well, I'm saying you take action local. Just don't talk about it. No derogation to William Roberts. He was on it. This is telling you that, right there, that they need to get the local and national, international level agreement. It just doesn't happen on its own. It's not forced on anybody. The range of policy actions include promoting cross-sectional and cross-institutional collaboration. Well, that's your university system, that's your cops, that's your uh, agencies of government, that's your districts, all this, this, you know, your water districts and all that stuff. Everybody's involved. Your, your, your institutions, your academic, and then inside those processes, your bar association, all that's cross-institutional. Further integration, further integration of sustainable forest management into national economic development strategies and capacity building for the systemic, uh, systematic forest data and information, particularly on the non-cash and informal benefits that forests contribute to economic development. They're talking about raising aesthetics, the lack of value into a place of value, and utilizing them to displace your wealth-driving, productive, improving, uh, improvement, improving production and intensive use of your of your lands. It's non-use, and this starts to get us to the point of the idea of why they want you to go to a let it burn policy. It doesn't make any sense when you talk about like tourism, just the aesthetic of having tourists around, that's all they're talking about, to go look at how pretty the trees are, and the fish and the so-called pristine water they live in, like it's not supposed to, like it doesn't have to be purified. 
But this is the kind of thing they're talking about. This policy is a step aside what you're supposed to be doing, and they tell you and told you this is a different than your National Environmental Policy Act, which shows the mankind's environment that productive use of the land is the most important, but not to be disregarding nature in doing. In other words, uh, you make sure that you maintain the environment so it can continue to give to you uh, what you put in uh, from what you put into it back out on a sustained yield. Different term, not sustainability with all these all this uh, anchor and millstones, but just the the fact of its sustained yield that you continue to get like a like any uh, rancher can. Uh, any farmer who does well, he can continually get from the ground. The ground continually, Mother Nature continually gives to them. And if they do it right, then they get Mother Nature will provide birds and other animals and all kinds. The manned interaction with the with the ground uh, brings and fosters and encourages the biodiversity. They don't tell us that. They tell us that we're uh, the people are, are are a scourge, something they're going to clean. So here we have. Directly go back to the UN, UN Agenda 21 in the wiki tells us to go to the Economic and Social Affairs Division. We go there, they're going to control your forests by going through aesthetics uh, as the policy that the EPA is making tools and management considerations for as they advance the environmental pillar to all the, all the, all the agencies doing any work in the United States of America. And they're doing worse than that. If you don't, so if you think that this economic and social environmental uh, thing is spacious, and uh, not important to the UN, but look, I found a, a job that's no longer available. Someone picked it up uh, regarding the uh, Na- United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia. I was looking for someone to work for. And B, well, first of all, you have to, one of the things you have to be able to do, and your key objectives of this job would be to foster economic integration at the sub regional and regional level. So, what did I say before, the this, this, United Nations Economic and Social Commission is listed within the context of Agenda 21 implementation as a regional player. And so their their employee comes in as a sub-regional, a regional and sub-regional player to promote the regional implementation of the internationally agreed development goals, including the sustainable development goals, and support regional sustainable development by helping to bridge you're the bridge building, economic, social, and environmental gaps among member states and sub-regions. In other words, make the net tighter. Bring the noose tighter around your neck, but it's on these economic, social, environmental considerations, the pillars that the local EPA in the nation of the United States is advancing the environmental pillar of, which is integral in the rest to advance what? Climate change. These people, even when you go get a job, it is the only thing in the UN they look at. Let's remind you back then why was Oregon dealing with it if it's a foreign thing? And why was the production considerations in that document? Well, let's go and look at the distinction they said is different. And what was different than their collaboration process and their assessment tools and all the way they integrate was that what they said. I'll just go to there, the National Environmental Policy Act. Right? That's what they said. It's different. Now, it talks about environment, but it's different. So I'm hoping some of you, you kind of said, well, how is it different? And let me just read right from the front, the, the front part of it, the top of it. Uh, the, what it. What's considered by this environmental policy? And I have to tell you, folks, after looking at this for quite a long time, it, it sure seems to me that we've had some, uh, for as much as we may disregard or d- d- be dejected by what we see as government. There's somebody in the government that's helping us. There's somebody that notices things. And some of this stuff has not escaped their view to protect. And you see it right here in the beginning, the Section 2 of the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, the thing that's different than what the EPA is promoting to bring in as a foreign agenda, the sustainability, sustainable development agenda, which is a centralized control where you have no property and no control and you're actually the enemy of that system. And they look to protect their system always. Remember what I tell you about the occupying force protects themselves. They're always looking at how what you do will affect what they're doing and protect against it and try to get you to agree to what they're doing. And they have plenty of techniques. Let's read NEPA. The purpose of this act are 
to declare a national policy which will encourage productive and enjoyable harmony between man and his, and his environment, to promote efforts which will prevent or eliminate damage to the environment and biosphere and stimulate the health and welfare of man, to enrich the understanding of the ecological systems and natural resources important to the nation, and to establish a Council of Environmental Quality. Now, what's not noble sounding about that? Being living in enjoyable harmony with your nature, not as an enemy when they tell you that, it's, that their policy of integration is different under social, environmental, and economic pillars. What are they saying? But that they don't agree that you should live in productive, enjoyable harmony. They didn't say health to stimulate the health and welfare of stakeholders, did they? No. And please, women, don't take offense. They use the word man. That's the generic. Don't do that to ourselves. That's, if you did that to yourself, you've got to take a step back and you've you got a little bit of work to do on, on, on how we've been progr misprogrammed. And I hope you didn't. I hope you didn't take offense. That will be great because it's one less thing we've got to worry about being programmed by. But did you hear the difference, the productive and enjoyable harm? What have I been calling out? But the producers, the landowners, the private users granted the rights to use the land are never mentioned or brought in, and they're not considered stakeholders. I hope you are connecting that right up right here. What's the difference? There's a balance between what man does and his environment, with his environment, to continued a productive and enjoyable harmony. Let me ask you a question, those of you living in the smoke-filled areas or maybe to be living in the, in the conflagration zone. Do you enjoy that living? Do you enjoy that nature that's burning up around your nose? Can't see the sun for a month? That's what we just went through, maybe over a month. What is that thing in the sky? Oh, that was the sun we haven't seen. Do you enjoy, you have a produ in, productive enjoyment of nature and your natural surroundings? right now under the current forest policy? And if you say no, then you're answered the question why it's different. And they agreed. They've already told you. You don't have to make an argument over this or question how it's different. It's different because they don't want you to be a productive and enjoying your nature. Your nature and the one you live in. And it's right here, right in the first... I was always blown me away when I finally read again. Reading that black and white, it really starts to eliminate. I wish more of you would do it. It wouldn't be, none of this would be such a question as it always it seems to be to a lot of people. But here it is. If you want a phrase to take away for yourself and what the law is, is to, it, it, this whole situation is about the national policy is to encourage productive, productive and enjoyable harmony between man and his environment. Get out there and do it, folks, and enjoy yourself. No harm anybody. Try not to harm nature, because if you harm nature, you're going to harm yourself. Take a little bit of principle there. You shouldn't be doing it anyway. But when the agenda gets a hold of it, it has perv it's looked through the myopic view of this term, social, environmental, and, and, and economic demand, if you understand the distinction here. So, again, there's a ton to read. I'm, just, I'm barely making through here as fast as I can with so much to get through. Uh, to understand that once you read this, you see there's two different worlds. The one we should be living and not enjoying and not productive, not being productive through the one we should be having that's in law, and the one that they're putting on us that's completely counter. I talk of production. That's conservation in the old definition. The new conservation is non-use. How can you be in productive harmony when they want to take everything away from you? I mean everything, even you. So let's move on to the implementation. Now I get to the forest policy. And I'm not going to read the entire forest policy. Uh, it's the 1995 forest policy. I need to move over here for a second, folks, to because uh, I have a couple things to read. I to use uh, two machines to do it. Um, implementation of your of your in the United States of America, you have a 1995 forest policy, fire, wild wild lands forest policy, and in it's an implementation uh, section. And I want to touch right there because we're looking for what? The whole night, the whole day, excuse me, the whole afternoon here, or the broadcast here, we've been looking for the three-word terms. Is this 
is this imposition, this demand on how you fight fires that was adopted in Oregon where there's a big, one of the biggest fires, well, the big, one of the biggest fires in history was in Oregon in, in, in 2002 when these documents were written, actually. The, there's another one growing on, on right now. Why? When the law says productive use, and we found out in the 70s we could produce, uh, we could harvest as much to pay off taxes, to give ourselves nice roads, to have access, to have uh, clean water, watersheds are working like crazy, lots of business. Why has it changed that we have fires now that no one understands, that they blame on climate change? The weapon. Well, that's why. It's because it's the weapon. Why aren't we in a productive harmony, enjoyable harmony with nature, and now we're at odds? Is because the People who are now in control, the governance infiltrating your system has now imposed that thing that's different than your law. And I really appreciated that admission that, that what the, this inclusive nonsense is all about, this collaborative process, is different than the, co the, the common knowledge of what the law and production and wealth generation really is. The implementation of your fire policy, let's look and see if this concept, social, environmental, and economic term is also there, done in 1995. How far, how far back? How far back were these guys working, folks, even? But here, let's read for it. Implementation of the fire policy. Implementation. Managing for landscape health. What happened to the watershed? Right here? I guess I could interject lots of this. I've got to be careful not to. I want to read right through this. Listen for the words that I've been holding, holding back. Listen for collaboration, lab collaborative, uh, collaboratively, any of, those, any of those things. Listen for the social. Listen for the economic. Listen for the benefits or value, any of that stuff. Just listen for it. Listen to how this works. Listen for climate change. This is the implementation of your fire policy. Now, what does all this have to do with, what does all that have to do with fighting a fire? As we keep talking, because we're in the middle of it, like I said, a, a thousand feet away from an alert one fire, stage one fire uh, condition is not, not too nice to be living in, notwithstanding the, the smoke. But wh why are we even having to deal? Why don't we attack the fire? Well, when I was in looking at doing this, and I really wanted to do this, we used to call it a, a hell attack crew. You, they trained you to get on uh, with, a, with a few man crew on a helicopter and they dropped you off in the middle of a fire and your job was to put it out or die. Well, it wasn't quite that die. They don't put you in the die section. But that's what it was when you jumped into it. You went to fight and attack that fire and you, you downed it. You put it down. No, manage the fire. That's the change. The change has been caused by this collaborative process to let fire be a tool for restoration, which is an oxymoron. Fire destroys. It may destroy productively in the way that it gets rid of fuels, but that's not restoration. What are they restoring it to? But the wild, whether that burns up or not, is irrelevant. And the only constraint is that your life or your property, as long as they can keep you outside of that, uh, from having that interference uh, that they cause for your life, they're con constrained underneath this new this 1995 Policy Act, which has been amended but has not been changed in its purpose. Implementation. Managing for landscape health requires expansive and cooperative interagency prescribed fire programs. Agencies must make a commitment with highly qualified people from leader to practitioner and from funding mechanism to conduct the program. Federal agencies must foster a workforce that understands the role of fire and at the same time raise the level of public understanding. Public opinion and perception may limit increases in interagency prescribed fire programs if this is not achieved. Therefore, continued federal effort to work collaboratively with, the, with and educate private landowners, interest groups, and the media is paramount. Education efforts should focus on exposing the public to accurate information on the environmental, social, and economic benefits that result when prescribed fire is used how natural resources may be maintained. And the risks involved include those associated with not taking action. Increased use of wildland fire may also increase public exposure to smoke and reduce visibility. Understanding of the trade-offs involved is an important educational objective. 
recent concerns about potential climate change caused by increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have also raised questions about the potential impacts of increasing the use of fire. Current analysis suggests that the carbon dioxide released from prescribed fires is ultimately removed by the subsequent regrowth of vegetation. Let me stop right there. You heard all the cues. There are climate changes connected with the whole this thing. Carbon dioxide, your carbon market. Remember earlier in the broadcast, I talked about the sustainability and the carbon dioxide emissions. We know the carbon dioxide market sits there, which is going to implement this as a tax on all your lives. But they tied its whole fire policy and implementation to the social and economic benefits they have to educate you to buy into. It's right in this 1995, for predating all the documents I've read, just after 1992, it was already in effect, utilizing this international imposition as a demand that you're going to have to get used to. Can I tie Agenda 21 and sustainable development to the fire policy? Not in one document, as I told my friend. I can do it, and I think I just, hopefully you see that I just did took a while here. We've really got more to go yet. There's still more to explain, folks. I think the fire policy can be shown to be implementing an agenda that's foreign to your needs. And what about those needs? And what about this thing? What is this forest poli fire policy? As I've explained to you before in another broadcast, and I mentioned it, I, don't, I didn't quite do too much more than to mention it. Again, people take this information and they mess it up. They muck this whole thing up. And that, that's a lot of work for me and my colleagues. So I explain this stuff, but I'd be careful on maybe going too far. Today I'm going to go a little bit farther. I'm going to read the executive summary of this fire policy. This is the thing you live under. Uh, it's the low bar that was sent to Im impose, impose the UN pillars of sustainable development. And agreed to by the, all the way to the president. But you heard in every instance, it's different than law, and it's not... It's a suggestion. And inside the, and I won't find it, I won't read it today, but inside this, well, I will I'll read a little bit of the effect of it. It says the fire policy is not the premier authority. And it can't be. And it says that. So it's not like they're even lying to us. But well, let me get to this executive summary. The challenge of managing wildfire, let me, I, gotta interject, I could be interjecting a lot. I'm trying not to interject. I think you're not getting something when I don't interject because you don't understand the difference in the terms that they're being used that are not being used, uh, but it also interferes with the flow of the reading. That's why I ask you to go back and read. But in this case, I'm going to interfere, interject right here and try, to, try not to do it more. But managing wildfire. No, folks, you don't manage a wildfire. You attack it. You put it down because it's dangerous, right? And you see what happens when they get up. That's why they've been getting out of hand. You don't, you don't go in the middle of summer to do this either. But they want to now, the policy... The executive summary states in its first line, this is about managing that destructive force for good, but they actually don't do it for good. They do it for the agenda, and you are going to be educated to get used to it. And that's just a suggestion. Nobody looks at the d detail about that, and the local authorities don't understand this, and they think that they have to give up authority to the Forest Service when it steps up knowing that they're going to do a triage limited to the, with, by their resources and the view through the myopic view of the three pillars of the UN. Not a local plan, which these documents will tell you is the most favored part. And they'll tell you in this part, the, the challenge of managing wild, wildfire in the United States is increasing, increasing in complexity and magnitude. Catastrophic, uh, see I need to interject here and I'll stop uh, and I'll read. Increasing in complexity. When you understand the imposition is a demand, what's the complexity they're faced with? But you're becoming more in, more knowledgeable about the fact that they're doing a scam on you, and they have to figure out ways to cover and make that transparent to you. So they come in and they do now the promotions they do. Uh, the, 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 the daily report, I mean, watching some of the daily report, I can't watch them in, it makes me sick because I see, the, I see the, 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 the show, it's a script. And they tell you all about, they educate you on this script on telling you the fire report every day on what they're doing and how to promote it and make you feel good about it. They come to your towns and do town hall meetings about all that they're doing for you. You forget to figure out that the, if they were to just start harvesting and dealing with the, like they did in the 70s or so, we wouldn't have these fires. 
So they're self-inflicted wound heroes that they're utilizing the platform to sell the agenda and burn your forests under the cover that they're saving you or managing, restoring the forest that you need so bad. And in the whole time, the whole summer, you can't, you're coughing, you're choking, some people go to the hospital, maybe some people die, who knows. And then sometimes they get out of hand, a wind comes along, blows around, and it blows out, uh, blows up in your face and burns out things. But go back and read. The complexity is that you are becoming more aware of the demands that this foreign imposition sustainable development is putting on you, and it takes more to cover that up, like a cat box. Cat box cover-up. Talked all about this, folks. Uh, the challenge of managing wild, wildfire, wildland fire in the United States is increasing in complexity and magnitude. Catastrophic fire now threatens millions of wild land acres, particularly where vegetation patterns have been altered by past land use practices and a century of fire suppression. Serious and potentially permanent ecological deterioration is possible where fuel loads exceed historic conditions. Enormous public and private values are at risk and our nation's capability to respond to this threat is becoming overextended. The goals and actions presented in this report encourage a more a proactive approach to wildland fire to reduce the threat is their claim. Uh, I hope you hear the promotion starting about as I told you that they aren't restoring the forest they're using fire to manage the fuel load. They call it restoring like they're doing something because they have to they're in they're in the terminology of what they try to do, restoring Gaia. And this again, okay, that's the beginning of this discussion. The the um, executive summary starts like that. There's a whole bunch of things going on to this point. Following are the following are the key points made in this report. This is really important. Uh, to understand. I hope I can get through this. Protection of human life is reaffirmed as the first priority in wildland fire management. Property and natural cultural resources jointly become the second priority with protection decisions based on values to be protected and other considerations. That's the black hole right there of all the three pillars. Okay, But the, you'll hear them repeatedly say, we've got to save your life and we've got to save your property. Then they put that obligation on your local f firefighters, and that is the cost that you bear. And then they go ahead and, and let the fire burn up in the forest uh, under a, a restoration uh, a restoration fraud. Uh, wild land fire, a, as a critical natural process, must be, must be reintroduced into the ecosystem. This will be accomplished across agency boundaries and will be based upon best available science. Very serious problem here. That means they're telling you they're willing to trespass. Remember, the federal government's only a proprietor where it manages the land, not a sovereign. And it's no different than you or me, landowner. They're telling you they're willing to break their own boundaries to come after you with this fire. And they're going to do it by best available science. Go read the science, folks. When you look at the fire, this fire report, you find out the scientists that they uh, refer to only did a small area. And they tells you that his study cannot be used as a general follow fire policy science. It's for only what he did, where he did it, with the trees he did it, the, the type of forest he did it. They have, this is where I told you the problem, when they included the term best available science and there is none, you're at risk by that alone, and yet they've complied with the law. Your local people, your local decision makers have to attack that. There is no science, and therefore there is no security. That's why it's all models that they keep making up. There's a fire science for one stand of trees in one area at one altitude run by a scientist. There may have been more since then, but not very many. These are, take years and years to develop. But this is not about that. It's about making the models that make you think that they're doing best available science, which is zero science, and then they can get away with it. Where they get away with it, you lose. Agencies will create, second, another point, agencies will create an organizational climate that supports employees who implement a properly planned program to reintroduce fire. So the plan is telling you they're not going to just use the flyer that's there and natural. They're going to reintroduce it. Every area with burnable vegetation will have an approved fire plan. Have any of you went out to make sure they have an approved fire plan? And how can it be approved if there is actually no best sciences and the locals really know best how to fight it? 
Did you check about this? Where wildland fire cannot be safely reintroduced because of hazardous fuel buildups, some form of pretreatment must be considered, particularly in wildland urban interfaces. And when I read that one, it reminds me of how they pretreat a road to help to uh, burn off either side of the road before they cause you uh, the forest to burn down to the road. Because otherwise, it would jump the road and go and br- take all the houses out across the road. And I'm saying that particularly to an area that's near me. I wa- you can watch this this provision of this plan working, uh, right? Right? How they fight? Uh, they def- how they manage the fire? Wildland fire management decisions and resources management decisions go hand in hand and are based on approved fire management, and land, and resource management plans. Do you have one, folks? Does your local authorities have one? Now, if not, this is this plan rules and it runs roughshod over everybody. At the same time, agency administrators must have ability to choose from full spectrum of fire management actions from prompt suppression to allowing fire to function in its natural ecological role. Well, remember, they did say that they were looking for the health effects, and if the health effects go too much, maybe your local officials have a way to start to pry the limpet off the rock here and say, wait a minute, you can't use, you can't use fire, smoldering fire in, an inver- in, a, in a meteorological inversion. That's killing people or causing them to go to the hospital. Stop it. Maybe you can start there, folks. Right there is right where they tell you how to do that. All aspects of wildfire management will be conducted with the involvement of all partners, programs, activities, and uh, processes will be compatible. Isn't that the integrated model, folks? They all will follow this pattern. The role of the federal agencies in wildfire urban interface include wildland firefighting hazard fuels reduction, cooperative prevention and education, and technical assistance. No one entity can resolve and manage all issue, interface issues. It must be a cooperative effort. Ultimately, however, the primary responsibility rests at the local and state levels. What have I been telling you where, where the authority really is? That key point tells you where the authority really is. Ultimately, however, the primary responsibility rests at the state and local levels. And if your local officials have not taken up the responsibility this plan kicks in. Now, I, I, someone that's going to thieve what I'm telling is going to do all the wrong actions here. They don't understand it. There's a whole dynamic of what allows you to say what you need to do. It's the, I think, part of the lack of understanding of what fire does and the dynamics of fire as we start seeing lots of uh, ideas coming out of what causes the big fires like, let's say, done in Reading. There are lots of theories. Kind of irritating, actually, because it covers this up. Covers this up. The structural fire protection in the wildland interface is the responsibility of tribal, state, and local governments. What did I say? They are willing to go extrajudicial at their fire, but they're going to make you come in and fight their problem, which is the reintroduction of fire. Not just let it burn, but get it burning and keep it burning. The Western Governors Association will serve as a catalyst to involve state and local agencies and private pro- private stakeholders in achieving a cooperative approach to fire prevention and protection in the wildland urban interface. So you hear all the words of collaboration, the destruction method, the method of destruction, divesting you of your r- property rights and your rights and your and your say and your se- and your consent is taken right here. But it's done by the Western Governors Association. Research that out, folks. Your governors work back in Washington to destroy you. You think you have Tenth Amendment rights? This association destroys those. This is the enemy, given the, the ability to be the catalyst to impose these, these things on the states and your local agencies and you as property owners. That's a catalyst. It doesn't mean it needs to be used. Why? Because the local state or local authorities are the ultimate authority. Federal agencies must place more emphasis on educating internal and external audiences about how and why we use and manage fire. What they say, they're going to educate you to buy into the fact that they're going to use fire and smoke you out or burn you out. Oops. All right? So this is, we haven't talked about the fact that fires get away. Go talk about the Greece fire, one in Greece, and tell me about that. You tell me what's going on. This is not a global plan to burn people out. It's all over the place. Taint. Uh, trained and certified employees will participate in wildland in the wildland fire program. Others will support the program as needed. Administrators are responsible and will be accountable for making employees available. 
good data and statistics are needed to support fire management decisions. Agencies must jointly establish an accurate, compatible, and accessible fire database of fire and ecosystem-related data. Ecosystem is the attachment of sustainable development and the attachment of that to climate change. Their, their whole data will try to prove and promote and educate you into that. This is The promotion of this is all important. You will live with this fire. The reintroduction. You mean the reintroduction? When did it go away? See, it's a natural process and it's an unnatural answer to make it look like it's a natural process and they're actually using it as a tool of destruction. This is how this whole thing really works. The succession of the actions recommended in this report depends on four things. This is the Achilles heel of this report. Every agency administrator must ensure that these policies are incorporated into all actions. What? The three pillars are incorporated into all actions. They must do that. Fire professionals must work with agency administrators to make the policies work on the ground. Managers and staff must actively implement the recommendations and work with their constituents to ensure success. And every employee of every agency must be committed to follow through on the ground. Isn't that what the documents for sustainable development and the EPA and the toolkit all said has to happen? You are going to be integrated with this and there's nobody outside. That's the outcome of this that when you get involved. You will participate in this fashion. Finally, agencies and the public must change their expectations that all wildfires can be controlled or suppressed. No organization, technology, or equipment can provide a absolute protection when unusual fuel, fuel builds up, extreme weather conditions, multiple ignitions, and extreme fire behavior come together to form a catastrophic event. Well, they tune, they tune this up into a false positive. Of course, it won't stop all fires. Lightning causes fires. There's all kinds of things that cause fires the least of which is them dropping incendiaries from drones now, they admit. Multiple ignition points, folks, they cause them. But we can't expect that, so you are going to have to change your expectations that all wildfires are contained and suppressed. Why? Because their policy is they're going to let the fuel loading go up and it can't be contained. Let me remind you, Jefferson Mining District, left side of the page, down to the fire can fire level a class map and you're going to see the right the east side of Oregon with at least maybe half in red that's the forest service management letting that go to catastrophic fuel loads that's not in law supposed to exist is that the self-inflicted wound in evidence i think it is go look at it when they talk about the catastrophic event and the unusual fuel builds up, they've caused it when they stopped harvesting and stopped doing cleanup and started letting the industry that used to do all that clean it up. Did that stop the fires then? No. But did we have the big fires then? No. And so this is a kind of a lie, a deception here. But you will be expected to change your expectation on what they do with fire. That's the education process that promotes what? It's the social, environmental, and economic pillars. To effect the recommendation changes and to achieve the consistent federal policies reflected in this report, the steering group recommends that all agencies be directed to develop implementation plans that include actions, assignments, and time frames. The steering group, like, this, like the Titanic steering into the iceberg. That's how it makes this work. That's an Achilles heel. Your local authority, the ultimate local authority, has the ability to make laws, will no longer accept this as the low bar. And once they start putting the higher bar in, and they do it, they have to do it right. So don't just think you can start writing a bunch of stuff off and, and do this. And once you hit the Achilles heel, opens the door, trips them up, opens the door, and then you make your high bar. And you start applying everything you have as the right that the NEPA, I would say as a guideline, would allow. You're going to start to see this thing start to change again. Uh, harvesting won't be the first thing in, but it's going to be an eventual thing if you all want to work for it. Uh, we have guys that are trying, doing our best. We think we're, we're making slow progress, but it's too slow. People are going to die on this. So uh, did I uh, or not, uh, in your mind, tie together the federal, the UN uh, economic, uh, environmental, and um, environmental connection with the method, the collaboration and cooperation, with the insistence on education that they're, they're right and you are wrong, uh, with the 
complete and full work, unified work, the complete and full integration of this as a uh, almost a propaganda tool in order to get you to agree with their imposition, their demand. Remember, it was a demand. Uh, let's now go, let me tie this up a little bit more. And who is really involved with this? Who is the moving factor in this across the globe? You don't think this is global. Could this be attached to UN, UN uh, Agenda 21? Could this be sustainable development? Well, they tell us it is. They said it right in the document. They tie it together with all the, the proof that we need through the agencies that do it, through the implementation. All different than law. And the ultimate authority is not them or that suggestion. It's the local authority, your local authority, your government, that doesn't understand all this, that makes excuses on and on. And I don't. this is the thing I don't get. I don't get. And this is why I can't really talk to too many people uh, and why they think I maybe be arrogant because I just say, here's the answer. Why don't we just do that? I guess that's a little bit too quick for most people. I, I don't know. I mean, the law should be the law, right? I mean, we, we, otherwise, what purpose? Is I guess is my other point. Why am I, why are you why are we being imposed upon if there's no uh, well? If we're getting imposed upon because there is no peace. There is no law. Let me go to you now. Bring us back full full circle. What's the implementation threat here as well? The demand, the suggestion, the advice, the promotion. American Bar Association Task Force on International. Rule of Law Symposia, Sections of Environmental, of Environment, uh, and Energy and Resources, Standing Committee on Environmental Law Section, and the State of the Local Government Law Rule of Law Initiative. Lots of words, but local folks and global all at the same time. On the point of the environment, through the Bar Association. Resolved that the American Bar Association urges, remember there's no law here, it's just getting you to comply and getting you to agree, urges governments, businesses, non-governmental organizations, and other organizations to consider the integrated rule of law initiatives with global environmental policies. Let me remind you that the Bar Association is an agency of your state. Most likely it's an agency of every state. I haven't really been able to track everybody down, but they're there. In the one in the states I'm talking to you where this initiative comes, they are an agency of the state. Now, if you're a business that comes against this, do you think you're going to get treated fairly by their judges? their court system? Not likely. So this is a pretty big threat here. It's a pretty big interference on an urging. But there it is nonetheless as they talk about it. Here's the report. Again, all these are reports. There's no law here. Ideas by associations, non-governmental organizations is the UN. Those are the non-governmental organization is certified by the UN to be such. You're just not anything. You are a thing. Uh, the American Bar Association has established a goal eight of the association of the association's mission statements and goals to advance the rule of law in the world. And they call it the rule of law. It should be tr it should be like a registered trademark here. It's a product, folks. Your legal system is a product. Here, the association has activities underway under to advance goal eight, where a collectively refer which are collectively referred to as the rule of law initiative. In August of two thousand and three, folks, back when. The American Bar Association House of Delegates adopted the resolution supporting the concept of sustainable development. Not a law, not even a policy, just an idea. But they're going to support the concept of sustainable development in this House resolution report, which resolved inter alia that the ABA recognized that good governance and the rule of law are essential to achieving sustainable development. Not government and law, but governance, the government impo imposing, demanding sustainable development, and their oversight is going to be the way they achieve sustainable development. And that the ABA should, quote, consider and promote sustainable development principles in the work of its entities to better understand and promote the principles of development in the relevant fields of law. May I call your attention to the relevant fields of law is your life. All the goals in Agenda 21 is what they're going to promote here as an NGO as well as an agency of your state as well as the guiding judicial branch of your government. If you didn't think you were wrapped up and then the legislative branches, these guys, these attorneys, these bar members that are in that side making these law laws up. The uh, years since the Sustainable Development Resolution 
has seen a dramatic rise in global concerns regarding the planet's environment. Since when did these people get involved with having a say in all the planet's environment? In 2005, the United Nations Environmental Program, program uh, UNEP, issued a report on the Millennium Eco Ecosystem Assessment, Ecosystems and Human Well-Being. The Millennium Report concluded that over the past 50 years, humans have changed the ecosystems more rapidly and extensively than in any comparable time, uh, period of time in history. This has resulted in substantial and largely irreversible loss in the diversity of life on Earth. They've now made them maintain themselves as the, the overseers of the world. So they are now in league with this. Let me read down to where it says sustainable development. Sustain and this is in this document still, the report. Sustainable development is one of the most significant developments of international environmental law. Defining sustainability remains un uncertain and, un and controversial. Un con controversial. Defining sustainability remains uncertain and controversial. Because it's not law, folks. It's not substantial. It's a made-up thing. It's a concept. The Brundtland Commission defined it as development that meets the needs of the present without compro compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. The 1972 Stockholm Conference began to address the tensions between environmental protection and the development and the need of developing countries to be allowed to move toward development. Are you a developing company, country, company yeah, in the United States? I don't think so. But this is what they have. It goes on, the 1992 UN Conference on Environmental Development at Rio de Janeiro, the Earth Summit was charged by, by the United Nations General Assembly to elaborate strategies. And this document goes on in this report from, the, you know, from this agency, this association, to tell you about what they're going to do to you when you understand the, 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 uh, the wordage and the way they constrain this that's aside the law, not the law, different than the law. Let me take you back to the very first document, or where Oregon. I want to point out we have the Bar Association and their members. Every entity is involved in promotion. Let's go back to the members of the Federal Forest Land Advisory Committee that made that, uh, co that collaborative report on addressing the vision of the Federal Forest Lands for Oregon is no, lo no other than Ralph Blomer of Craig Law Research. and He's also a university professor at uh, Lewis and Clark University. He's an attorney advancing this whole thing through that collaborative dispute resolution process, which can only be implemented underneath administrative law in that state where it doesn't violate other provisions of law. It says it right in their own documents. So what they do is they violate that provision as well. Because there's your wealth, your health, your production, your productive harmony, your enjoyment of that production, is all in law, and they're subverting it. That could be... that. So, is your fire policy subverting your life? Well, just look around and choke on the smoke some more, and you're not enjoying it. That should be the facial problem. But there's a mechanism why you're seeing in the West, and anywhere else the fire burns in the forests, uh, this thing that goes on that's now reached catastrophic levels. It's part of the plan. I've told you their, pl their plan is our problem. But we're not helpless to it, I just ex expo exposed to you that it's there and some of the Achilles heels on how to address it. And your power is local. They, they already know that, folks. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope something I said uh, inspires you to dig in and go help yourself out. Stop this smoke and fire and get on the other things, all the other securities they bring on you that are all frauds based on the collaborative process and these attorneys that are just going to promote this UN agenda on you. It's not a theory. It's not a not a not anything other than uh, than the fact of the reality and what obscures your ability to get at things uh, today. The Grimner, thank you for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. Appreciate all that stuff you do and help helping out uh, me today on the audio and uh, with the, with the quality. I had a problem there, but thank you there and uh, all you guys, that are, uh, gals that are doing the uh, likes and whatever support and the reposting of the broadcast. I do uh, I appreciate it, and I'll be with you next week. At Tech diffs or nature will. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
Well, that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. <laughs>